Abrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, we love you, and we adore you. Father, I thank you for this Shabbat that you have given us, this opportunity to gather together as Mishpachah's family to worship before you, to rejoice in your presence, and to hear from you. Father, I pray that as we open up your word today, that you will speak boldly into our hearts and our lives, and it be your word heard, your heart felt and received, that nothing of me will be involved except that which you have ordained specifically for this purpose. Father, breathe new life into us today as we open up your word and dig into this week's Parsha, Parsha Lech Lecha. And Father, as, as we uh, seek your face today, if you are calling us to move forward in your direction of our lives, Lord, and your calling over our lives, whatever it may be, Father, give us the encouragement through uh, this week's Parsha to pack up, pick up, and move, to follow you as you lead, unashamed, unafraid, and unreserved. B'Shem Yeshua Meshachim, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen, amen and Amen. This week's Parsha is Parsha uh, Lech Lecha, uh, which comes from Genesis chapter 12 through 17. Uh, this is a, a really fun Parsha because there's just so much happening in Parsha Lech Lecha. If you've read through it already, you'll notice there's about 38 plus different ways that this message could go. Um, and uh, as we're moving through the, the, the story, building up to the, the, the development of the nation of Israel, we now have entered into the period of time in which we see the building of uh, the people that we often say, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. We're starting to watch the building of how he became the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, as Lynn said during worship this morning, Abraham, uh, for all intents and purposes, at least up to this point, previous to Exodus 12, or Genesis 12, we have no real evidence that Abraham was anything other than uh, part of paganism and the culture around him like everyone else. His father was a high priest. Uh, in, in pagan culture, etc. And so we have no evidence that prior to God calling him out, that he was anything more than anybody else around him. And so it's really interesting that we see this man who, who really didn't have a direct connection with the Lord uh, up to this point, although tradition, Jewish tradition says that he had begun filling this calling and seeking out, looking for who the one and only God was, and uh, that he looked around the world and said, there's no way all of this exists. If there isn't a God who created this and put this all into play and started talking to his friends and family and, and so on and so forth. Um, but as we look at this, we recognize definitively this is the point in time in which Abraham accepted uh, the God of all creation. The God who would become known as the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel as his own personal God and began to follow him uh, with everything that he has. So if you have your scriptures, go to open up to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. This is the very beginning of the Parsha. It says, Then Adonai said to Abram, Get going out from your land and from your relatives and from your house and your father's house to the land that I will show you. My heart's desire is to make you into a great nation, to bless you, to make your name great so that you may be a blessing. My desire is to bless those who bless you, but whoever curses you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, uh, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went just as Adonai had spoken to him. Also, Lot went with him. So we recognize from the closing of last week's Parsha that Abraham had actually already began this journey. He may not have realized it yet, but he had already began this journey himself because he was with his father, who if you read in the Parsha before, his father was actually traveling from uh, Chaldees to Canaan, to the land we now know as Israel. And along the way, his son Haran dies, and he lands in a town called Haran, and he had this little emotional connection because his son that was dead is named the same as this town that he's in, and he just lays roots there and doesn't move any further. So it was from Haran that the Lord says, okay, Abraham, get up and leave your family, leave your household, leave everything you've ever known, and continue on this journey that I've already started bringing you on. So it's interesting watching God's providence in all this as even before Abraham recognized God as his God, recognized Adonai as the God, the supreme God, the God of all creation, that he was already on the beginning of this journey. Anybody experienced something like that in their lives before? It's awesome watching how God brings us from one place to the next, even before we recognize that this is what's happening. But as we realize in this first part, part of the Parsha is that God tells Abraham specifically why he's calling him out. It's not because Abraham is this really awesome dude, not that he's not either, but it's not because Abraham is this really awesome dude. It's not because there's anything particularly special about him. It's not because there's anything about him that stands out above anyone else. 
But it's simply because, uh, as he says here, verse 2, my heart's desire is to make you into a great nation, to bless you, to make your name great so that you may be a blessing. My desire is to bless those who bless you, but whoever curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The reason Abraham, the reason Isaac, the reason Jacob, the reason the people, the nation of Israel was called out wasn't because we were all that awesome. It wasn't because there's was anything special about us. It was because God wanted to bless the entire world through us. And what is that blessing? It's the seed of Abraham that we read about later as this covenant continues to develop. And that seed of Abraham is in the person of Yeshua through whom all salvation flows. And so as we look at the partial, we recognize that God's desire for his people wasn't simply to be building a people of his own, but to be building a people through whom all the rest of his creation, who are also his people, would be blessed. So that all humanity could be brought back into his embrace. We move forward to... Genesis chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. And, and this is, as I was reading through the Parsha, you know, the, the Word of God is a, a living entity, right? We can read the same thing over and over and over again throughout our life. And every time we read it, God's going to show us something new. It's not that His words change. and not It's not that He suddenly plugs something new in there we haven't seen before. It's not that there's some, like, secret hidden message that you've got to decode and yada yada. The reality is, is that his word is living and wherever we are in our life at that point in time, the Lord has a message for us right then and there where we are. And as I was reading through this Parsha, uh, getting ready for the message this morning, it really started to, to, to hit on me this idea of this, this very awkward sign of the covenant in Genesis 15. You guys read Genesis 15 before? This is the splitting of the animals and the presence of the Lord walks through the middle of this bloody mess of a scene and you know I, I kind of picture in my head the aftermath of like you know the police chalk lines around the split cabs and, and all this kind of stuff right I mean it's this bloody mess that's going on here and and I started looking go man it's just really weird like I mean this has got to be one of the weirdest things in the Bible there's a lot of really weird stuff in the Bible right we don't need Hollywood I mean if Hollywood ever made a movie actually based off the Bible I mean literally what the word of God said dude they did every mark they've got on what they think a blockbuster is uh, it's all there um, you know, chase scenes and war and, and uh, uh, political thrillers, and it's all right there. But as we look at this portion, this would be one of those things that would just be like, what just happened? And why? Why did that just happen? I don't, I don't understand. I don't grasp it. And I started to, to wrestle with this, trying to figure out what in the world was the point? What was the point to the, the, the calves being split and, and everything else? What was the point to all of this happening? What was the point to the presence of the Lord going through it? So if you have your scriptures, uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of Adonai came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And I'm going to pause right here. Because right here, things start to get interesting. Because what just happened? He just came back from war from saving Lot. Lot had gotten taken, captured, and him and this like ragtag bunch of dudes that he gathered together went after five kings and their armies for one purpose, to save his nephew. And what's really messed up about it is God didn't say, bring Lot with you. The whole reason that Abraham was in there, Abram at this point, was in this situation was because he didn't listen to God entirely. He listened to God. God said, get up and go, and he went. But God said, leave your father's household behind, and he didn't. He brought far, part of his father's household with him, right? And we recognize the sins of the fathers upon the generations, that, and so on and so forth. And we get to Rachel, and Rachel does the same thing. She brings one of the household idols with her. She brings part of her father's household with her. And so as we recognize this, this development of this narrative that's going on, and by the way, Lot ends up producing children that become some of the greatest enemies of Israel. As the nation progresses, but would have never been a problem had Abraham left the mind. And don't get me wrong, I appreciate Abraham's heart. I appreciate the love that he had for his nephew he had kind of adopted and taken in on his own. But the Lord said, leave all of it behind and go off and I want to make a nation from you. But I think to some degree there may have been something in the back of his mind that went, but Lot's kind of like a son and I'm you know, already pretty old and I don't have any kids yet. And there really is this blessing in store and this inheritance to be developed and maybe Lot could be that kid that's going to get it. Maybe I could. And we realize that, that Abraham's got this habit as many of us do. The Lord gives us a word. He gives us a calling. He gives us a promise and we get impatient. We try to make it happen on our own. 
We try to take the reins instead of letting God do what he's going to do, and we don't let the process play out. And so right after he's dealing with the consequence of not fully doing it, he did what the Lord said, but he didn't really do everything the Lord said. And he's dealing with the consequences from that, which, by the way, generations upon generations in the nation of Israel, his descendants are going to be dealing with that consequence as well. So he's dealing with the consequence of that, and immediately after that, the Lord then comes into this. And so verse 2 of chapter 15, But Abram said, my Lord Adonai, what will you give me since I am living without children? And the heir of my house, uh, my household is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no seed. So a houseborn servant is my heir. The word here in verse 2 for children in the Hebrew is, uh, is the word uh, ariri, which uh, means childless bare without children. But it comes from the root word arar, uh, which means to make bare, to demolish or to break. So he doesn't use the word yeled, uh, children, like we, we use in modern Hebrew, uh, but he uses this word ariri, which comes from the, the root word arar, which the root word means to demolish, to break, to, to make bare, to make uh, uh, without the, the production, the, the, the produce, the, the continuation of generations. And so he's crying out to the Lord. He's like, dude, you, you called me this. You gave me this promise. You gave me up, but you kind of missed out on the whole part that, there is no generation after me for this blessing to ensue that you keep saying you're going to receive the blessing to continue on. He's at this place of brokenness as he's looking at the promises and blessings of God, but the lack of, of vision for seeing that come through. And so he's at this really weird crossroad and he's broken. He's crying out in his brokenness to the Lord. He's saying, look, you've left me here demolished. You've left me here dead. I may be alive and kicking, but I've got no generations coming after me. I am dead as far as the world is concerned. Verse 4, then behold, the word of Adonai came to him saying, this one will not be your heir, but in fact, one who will come from you, from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up now at the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them, then he said to, to him, so shall your seed be. Then he believed in Adonai and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. It's a pretty powerful statement. The Lord said, he believed and he was counted righteous. It's a powerful statement. Immediately after seeing the consequence of a big mess up, the Lord reiterates his promise, his blessing, his covenant with him. And then not only does he reiterate it, but here Abraham actually believes it. And he buys into it and he locks on. Then he said to him, verse 7, I am Adonai who brought you from Ur of Chaldeans uh, in order to give you this land to inherit so he said, my Lord Adonai, how will I know that I will inherit it? Then he said to him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old uh, she-goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young bird. Notice anything interesting? There's a common denominator here with each of these. When we come to the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, these are the same animals that will be used in the sacrificial system of the priesthood in the temple and tabernacle. Powerful imagery. Then he said to him, bring me a three-year-old young cow, a three-year-old she-goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young bird. So he brought all of these to him and cut them in half and put each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. Then birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, but Abram uh, drove them away. When the sun uh, was about to set, a deep sleep fell on Abram. Behold, a terror of great darkness was falling upon him. And here we see almost this illusion, this note of the, uh, the reality of Sinai when the covenant, this is the covenant being made with Abraham, the covenant made with Israel at Sinai, and the, the, the fierce uh, gloom and terror that came over the nation as the presence of the Lord descended before them. Then he said to Abram, know for certain that your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I am going to judge the nation that they will serve afterward. They will go out with many possessions. But you will come to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at an, a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When, uh, when the sun set and it became dark, behold, there was a smoking oven and a fiery torch that passed between these pieces. 
Uh, what's really interesting here about this covenant between the pieces was that it is uh, it was actually an ancient Near Eastern method of cutting a deal or making a covenant. This was a pretty common theme in the ancient Near East. The less powerful party, generally speaking, was the one that would walk between the cut pieces, indicating that one's fate would be that of the cut pieces were he to violate the terms of the covenant. So had this been an earthly king and somebody in his kingdom making a covenant, the, the person that wasn't the king would be the one that would be walking through the cut pieces. So that person would be the one that would be taking on the responsibility of the covenant. But what's interesting here is in Abram's vision, however, it is not Avram, it is not Abram who walks between the pieces. It is the flaming torch, the symbol of God's presence. This is to show that God is, uh, that, that God is binding or coveting himself, covenanting himself to Abraham. Ultimately to Israel and to the Jewish people. Avram being passive in this uh, covenantal action shows that the covenant made with Avram and later Israel and the Jewish people as a whole is unconditional. All right. Abraham had no part in her. Avram at this point, Abram, his name hadn't changed, had no part in this. Other than he gathered the animals, but God was making the covenant. And notice it is a covenant marked by blood as the blood of the animals was, uh, was poured out. Even the Hebrew word that we read here for covenant, berit, like we have berit chadesha, the, the new covenant, uh, the, the uh, uh, aron ha-berit, the ark of the covenant, the word berit in Hebrew is connected to this type of ancient ceremony. The actual Hebrew word itself, berit, is connected to this ancient covenantal ceremony in which they would walk through the parts of the animal. And so it's really interesting that as we look at this, this covenant is being made between Abraham and Adonai, or more specifically between Adonai and, and, and Avram, and uh, Avram has no part in it. The Lord is the one that's doing this. Avram is passive, and the Lord is the one walking through. And so instead of the lesser party or the weaker party passing through and taking on the responsibility of the covenant, it's the Lord who is obviously the greater party in the discussion that takes on the role of walking through and takes on the responsibility of the covenant, which is a really powerful image for us to grasp because our relationship with the Lord, it doesn't hinge upon our action, although there is a necessity for our acceptance of his salvation and forgiveness, but all of that is hinged upon his action and what was done on the stake, what was done on the cross. Verse 18, on that day, I don't know, I cut a covenant with Avram saying, I give this land to your seed from the river of Egypt to the great, great river, the Euphrates River, the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Kadmonite, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephites, uh, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites who all resided in the land of Canaan at that point. By the way, uh, Caleb, who will later be the head of the tribe of Judah as Israel crosses into the promised land, one of the only two spies to bring a good report back, is originally from one of these Tribes from the Kenizzites. His father was a Kenizzite, which means he was born of the Kenizzite line. And yet, as one of the original inhabitants of Canaan, becomes one of the heads of the tribe of Judah and the lineage of Yeshua. I just want that to sink in for a moment. It has nothing to do with my message. It's just a really awesome image. Uh, uh, we move forward to Genesis chapter 17. And here again, we see another cutting of the covenant. There was the first cutting of the covenant with the, the, the covenant that was made with the passing through the animals, the, the split animals. And here we have another covenant that's made. And notice right before this, what happens? Immediately before this is uh, uh, Sarai coming to Avram and going, hey, you haven't any kids yet with me? Clearly, I'm not going to give you any because I'm old and decrepit and it's not going to go anywhere. But how about you take uh, Hagar, my servant, and you marry her and have a child with her. And maybe that can be the child that will be the child of inheritance. Uh, from your own body that the Lord will, will bring these promises and blessings through. So yet again, Abraham and Sarah take it upon themselves to try and fulfill God's promises and calling in their life on their own rather than being patient and awaiting the Lord to do what he says he's going to do. And so then there's the consequence that comes with it. Sarah becomes jealous of, uh, of Hagar and of, of Ishmael and forces them very angrily, very rudely, very diabolically out of the household and sends them running for their lives. And Abraham's left in the back. Avram is left back there trying to deal with the consequence and clean up the mess and handle the reality of what now sits. And immediately following this, again, they step outside of the will of God and do it on their own. There's consequence that falls. Post the consequence, what occurs now? God reiterates the covenant with him again. And this is a beautiful reality of the word of God. So we see here in chapter 17, beginning with verse 1. When Avram was 99 years old, uh, Adonai appeared to Avram and he said to him, I am El Shaddai, uh, continually walk before me and you will be blameless. 
My heart's desire is to make my covenant between me and you, and then I will multiply you exceedingly much. Abraham fell on his, uh, his face, and God spoke with him, saying, For my part, because my covenant is with you, you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer will your name be Avram, but your name will be Abraham, because I make you the father of a multitude of nations. I make you the father of a multitude of nations. Plural. Yes, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings will come forth from you. Yes, I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you, and throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. In order to be your God and your seed's God after you, I will give to you and to your seed after you the land where you are an outsider, the whole land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Uh, God says to Abraham, uh, as for you, my covenant must keep. You must keep. You and your seed after you throughout their generations. Uh, this is my covenant that you must keep between the, me and you and your seed after you. All your males must be circumcised. You must be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And this will become a sign of the covenant between me and you. Also, your 80-day-olds, eight day not 80 days, your 8-day-olds must be circumcised every male throughout your generations, including a houseborn slave or a slave brought, bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your seed. Your houseborn slave and your purchased slave must surely be circumcised, so my covenant will be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant, but the uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So here we see yet again that the Lord comes into the scene after uh, Abraham has already stepped out on his own, trying to make things happen on his own, and is, is dealing with the consequence that flows from that. Now the Lord comes back on the scene again, not that he ever left the scene, but he, he enters physically into the discussion again, and he dialogues with Abraham and says, hey, listen, I'm making your name from Avram to Abraham, uh, and beyond that, I'm making this covenant with you, which is not a new covenant, it is a renewal of the covenant that already existed. I'll let that sink in your head for a moment. It's not a new covenant, it is a renewal renewal of the covenant that was already there, just as the Brecha the Shah is not a new covenant, as a renewal of the covenants already made with Israel, which was a covenant to bless the entire world. So the renewed covenant, the Brecha the Shah, is a very literal interaction with that reality of the covenant made with Abraham. So as we look here, he makes this covenant, renews this covenant again with Abraham. This time, Abraham's not passive. This time, Abraham is the one doing the action involved in this, the, the covenantal relationship. This time, Abraham is the one that is dealing with the covenant, the, that is uh, the cutting of the covenant in a very literal sense um, for himself and his now 12-year-old son, Ishmael, and all of the people in his household. I imagine that at least for a few weeks, he was the least favored person in his household. Um, but as we recognize here, there's this renewal of this covenant. There's this continuation here. And, and it's really interesting because as we look at the idea that God is not making a new covenant with Abraham, but instead is renewing his covenant with Abraham. He is renewing the covenant that he's already made. This actually gives an allusion, if you would, it alludes to Israel at Mount Sinai. Because at Mount Sinai, Israel hears the audible voice of the Lord uh, speaking the Asherah and Hanibro, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, and then uh, post that, Moses goes up and he gets the tablets, he comes back down, and Israel is now in the midst of this huge golden calf sin scenario, and I won't go into a description of what else going there, you can read the text and figure it out yourself, but Moses comes down and there's this big scene going on, and he gets angry and he crashes the tablets. Well, when God gave him the tablets, which were a sign of the covenant, he was passive. God carved the stones. God wrote on the stones. God sent him down the mountain with the stones. He was passive. Israel was passive in the action. This time when he goes back up for the second set of tablets, he has to carve them. He has to bring them to the Lord and then the Lord etches on him. This time he's no longer passive and it's a renewal of the same covenant. And it's no longer a passive thing on Israel's side, but Israel had to take part in that covenant. And I started to think about that. Man, this is... This is powerful. This is important for us to grasp and understand. There's got to be something more to this idea of being passive in the covenant and having to be active in the covenant. There's got to be something more to what the Lord is saying and doing here. And as I started to pray and started to, 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 to think about this and process it, I started to, uh, to search about this idea of covenant in the Baruch HaDashah and the New Testament, uh, as it's commonly known in the New Covenant writings. And, uh, and, and it jumped out off the page at me, or I guess 
off the iPad because it's primarily what I use, but jumped off the, the page at me in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, this is what's often called the, the Last Supper. This is the, the final Passover Seder that Yeshua experiences with his Talmudim, with his disciples. Uh, chapter 26 of Matthew, beginning with verse 26, it says, Now while they were eating, Yeshua took matzah, and after he offered the brach of the blessing, he broke and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So here we see the matzah is symbolically representing Yeshua's body, which is about to be uh, killed so that we can have salvation. So we see this symbolic imagery of this matzah, of this piece of, of cracker, this unleavened bread representing Yeshua's body. And just as the, the, the animals that were used in the covenants in Genesis 15 were split in half for the presence of the Lord to cross through in a sign of this covenant here, the representation of the body of Yeshua is broken in half and is passed out to the disciples who ought to take part in, in this covenant now. And Yeshua says, take, eat, this is my body. He's now made brach over it and handed it out, the blessing over it. And verse 27 says, and he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the renewal of sins. We recognize that both the, the sacrifice that was necessary of the animals that were split in half for the covenant in Genesis 15 and the, the covenant that was made or the, the action of the covenant that was made in Genesis 17 both required blood. As a matter of fact, every covenant that we see requires blood, whether it's sacrifice or what have you, it required blood. And even atonement requires blood, blood for blood. And as we look at this, we realize that there's this really powerful interaction here as God again takes on the active role in this covenant. And we sit back as the passive role. And this time it's not a new covenant, it's a renewal of the covenant that already stood. A covenant that we not only broke, but we broke again and again and again and again and again and again. And yet here the Lord comes down, robed in flesh, tabernacles amongst us as the person of Yeshua Mashiach, born of a woman, to offer his life that we may be made clean, whole, righteous, and renewed in his presence again, that we can be restored through his salvation. Ultimately, this Yeshua is the seed of promise spoken of in the covenant made with Abraham. Not just the seed of promise, but he's the seed of promise through Isaac, through Jacob, through Israel as a whole, through the tribe of Judah, the lineage of Caleb, the lineage of Melech David, of King David, the lineage of Shlomo, Solomon, and so on until we get to Yeshua and we see this imagery of Yeshua coming up as the literal seed and the fulfillment of the covenantal promise made with Abraham that through his seed singular, as Paul makes a point to call out in Romans, through his seed singular, the entire world would be blessed. And it took him yet again, taking on the active role. He's the greater, we are the lesser. He takes the active role so that we can be passive and receive freely from him the realities of this renewed covenant. That we can become a part of his chosen people, renewed and restored, both Jew and non-Jew alike, brought together in the blood covenant of Messiah Yeshua, no longer focused simply on physical circumcision on the outward, the circumcision of the heart as promised in Deuteronomy. Circumcision of the heart as referenced to by Paul over and over again, as referenced to by Yeshua. Because it's not about the outward sign, but the inward sign that matters. Because this is a circumcision not done by the hand of man. Just like Yeshua's sacrifice was not a sacrifice done by man. But instead, this is one done by God himself. One that brings together in unity Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah, and allows for all of us to take part in the reality of the covenant made with Avram, later to be called Abraham, our forefather. It allows us the opportunity to take part actively in the reality of recognizing, serving, and making Adonai, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our God the God of Rabbi David, the God of Jacob, the God of Lynn, the God of Monty, the God of Robbie, the God of Joel, the God of Leah, the God of Melissa, and so on and so on and so on. It's not just our forefathers God anymore. He's ours. And he's a part of us. And he lives within us. We don't have to fall into a deep trance in order to experience him. 
We can experience him while wide awake and open eyed. We can see his presence. We can experience and feel the might and power of his Ruach HaKodesh, of his Holy Spirit. But it's because we are now unified under the covenant made by him. Not a covenant that we have to act in, but one that we pass that we get to take part in. We get to not only take part in the renewal of the covenant, but the renewal of the original covenant that we saw in the splitting of the animals in the presence of the Lord walking through. I don't know about you, but I just find that to be so exciting, to be so eye-opening and, and revealing to see that there's, you know, we, we talk so often about it being a living word, about it being something that every, that there's constantly something new to see, something, it's not that the word changes. Like we said earlier, it doesn't change. His word never comes back void and unfulfilled. It doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As a matter of fact, John 1 says that the word is Yeshua and that the word tabernacle amongst us. That word now resides within us. And so each and every year as we roll upon these parshot over and over and over again, something new pops out, not because God stuck something new in there, but because we are in a different place able to see something new that God wants to reveal. And I want you to understand that this message of the covenant renewed in Messiah is not a message just to the Jewish people. It's not a message just to the nations. Despite what either party would like us to think over all these years, this is a message through the Jewish people for the nations yeah. that we may all come together as one in him. And just as it is a message through the Jewish people for the nations, it's a message of the nations got to bring back to the Jewish people. It's a cyclical reality that we must walk in and operate in and live in daily. Because I don't know about you, but I want to see Messiah return. And he says he will not come back until all Israel proclaims Baruch HaBa B'Shemarai, until all Israel welcomes him, Yeshua HaMashiach, as their bridegroom. He will not return. And I want to see that day come. My heart's desire is to see our Jewish people come to the salvation of Yeshua HaMashiach through the blood of the Lamb that was slain, that we could be re-entered, not on our own, but on Him, into the covenant that our forefather Abraham was originally brought into. Into a covenant that continually had to be renewed over and over and over and over again, not because it didn't stand once and for all, but because we are miserable at honoring relationship covenants with the Lord. And yet in spite of us, that first covenant with Abraham, that first covenant was the Lord taking the responsibility of the covenant upon himself because he knew that you and I weren't capable of carrying the weight ourselves. And he renews it in the person of Yeshua, taking it on, the responsibility of that covenant on upon himself again because he knows that we are not capable of doing it on our own, but only through the work of Messiah in our lives. Amen. 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 Father of mercies, we worship you, we love you, and we adore you. Lord, I ask that you will continue to open our eyes to the truth and the reality of your words, that you will continue to open our eyes to the promise that Messiah was not something that randomly pops up in Matthew, but that we see Yeshua throughout the Tanakh over and over and over again. That every word of this progressive revelation from Genesis to Revelation was for the distinct purpose of bringing us to your promised Messiah, your only begotten Son, through whom we would be saved. Lord, I pray that you open our hearts and our eyes to be used by you in a mighty and powerful way to see others come to know the reality of this covenant relationship with you that can only be entered through blood, but particularly, specifically, and only the blood of Messiah, Yeshua. Father, I thank you for your salvation, for your grace, for your mercy that renews daily in spite of how awful we may try to be sometimes that you love us, cherish us, and are constantly pouring your mercies out fresh on us daily, ushering us back in, drawing us into your presence, and giving us the ability to boldly enter your throne room. Lord, we love you, we adore you, we worship you with all of our heart, and we give you all praise, adoration, and honor. B'Shem Yeshua In the name of Yeshua Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen. Amen.